Hello out there in Rescue Land. Chris Fader coming to you live from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania for another edition of Rescue Connection Live here on MedTex and Rescue You. And as I use my new glasses so I can see what's going on. Again, appreciate everybody joining in as we continue to uh, do our best to get information out to the rescue community, share information, allow you guys to ask, interact, and learn with the other folks that are just as geeky as we are when it comes to rope rescue. So without further ado, I am going to welcome in, or I should say, please uh, chime in and let us know how we sound. Uh, if you're watching, let us know where you're, uh, where you're calling from. Uh, but please help me in welcoming in Kevin Lunny from Vector Rescue. There we go. Kevin, hey, can you Yeah, I got you. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. Again, everybody uh, out there in rescue land, uh, Kevin Lunny is uh, someone I met formally at IDERS, the International Tech Rescue Symposium. Um, and uh, he's close enough to the Philly area that I felt like it was, maybe it was time for us to jam and talk about some stuff. So Kevin, welcome to the program and thanks for doing it. Thanks for having me. Uh, it, was, it was fun kind of nerding out about this in uh, Denver. And when you asked, it was uh, easy to say yes. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, you know, one of the challenges with doing these things is um, basically, what information can we get out there and how can we share with the other industries and, and folks out there so we can geek out on this stuff together? And your topic, I think, was certainly appropriate to talk about tonight because everybody knows there are those that like prospects and those that don't. So before we get into that, why don't you tell us a little bit about Vector and um, tell a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, so I am a career fireman in Danbury, Connecticut. Uh, I've been on the job almost 15 years there. Started off volunteering in my hometown, uh, both on the ambulance uh, and then with the fire department. Um, got hired by Danbury in 2007 um, and nerded out about, um, you know, the tech rescue stuff pretty early on uh, in the academy in Connecticut. Uh, at the time, anyway, you got um, operation level confined space. And I, I really enjoyed the, um, the critical thinking uh, aspect of it. And as my career progressed, um, when I got promoted, I ended up on our heavy rescue and kind of went full full tilt um, on this stuff um, and kind of read everything I get my hands on. And in 2019, uh, my business partner and I, James Croswell, uh, decided to start the business. Um, mostly it was kind of started out of um, a lack of having kind of options for uh, training beyond getting rope tech, um, you know, uh, pro board stuff um, in our area without traveling. And we really wanted to be able to provide classes that we would want to take locally without having to get on a plane and, and go halfway across the country. Um, uh, so unbeknownst to us, COVID hit uh, right after we kind of opened the doors, uh, which kind of slowed everything down probably for six, eight months um, going into 2020. Um, but it gave us time to kind of regroup and really work on our business plan. Um, in the past year and a half, we've really been taken off. So it's been been going very well. Good. Glad to hear that. And it's it's interesting you say that you started right before COVID uh, because, you know, I talked to a lot of people where COVID helped them or COVID hurt them. Uh, but I guess in your case, it, it kind of allowed you guys to grow the right way instead of having to, you know, like they say in Shark Tech, the worst thing you can do is have a product that you can't produce to people that want it quickly. Um, yeah. And, you know, we're very fortunate, right? We're, we're both career firemen. Um, so we weren't, you know, banking on this for uh, our livelihood, which made it very easy to kind of put everything on the back burner. Um, I know I, I've heard Shaggy from um, Vertical Integrity talk about it, and they, they were in a similar boat. They started right around the same time, and, uh, you know, he, he had shared, uh, in I think, a podcast I heard that they kind of had the same experience, that it kind of helped them put the brakes on and really focus on the business, um, and, and that was kind of our experience, too. Okay, good. Um well, I guess one of the big questions is, are you a Patriots fan? <laughs> I'm a 49ers fan, actually. Okay. I'm not a yeah. big sports fan, but I do support the home team. So um, I'll wait for this 15-second delay, and I'll wait to see the feedback, what people say about me asking that question. But go Eagles. Um, well, let's dive into it. So let's talk about uh, prostate bypasses. So I guess one of the questions is, um, where did the idea come from to test this? You know, what was it that made you say, why are we doing this? And does it really work? Um, you know, I, to be honest, I, I had never really questioned it um, for many years. You know, that's how I learned to do high lines. And it's, it's kind of pretty much out there. It's in all the textbooks as far back as, as I could look when I started doing research for this. 
um, ironically, right after Eiders in 2019, um, I was, you know, sitting in my basement, you know, uh, trolling on Facebook like one does on one of the tech rescue pages. And there was a, a lively conversation about the, the use of prussic bypass and um, why we do it. And somebody mentioned, um, you know, that it's, it'll help be a visual indicator of overtension on your control lines. Um, so I, you know, kind of chimed in that if, if your control lines are, are seeing that much force um, to kind of start having a prussic slip, there's probably something else really bad going on with your system um, that, that hopefully you caught. And, you know, as soon as I hit send, uh, Craig McClure must have been in his basement doing the same thing because he jumped right on me and was, was quick to point out that while all of that might be true, uh, there's, there's no empirical evidence anywhere to kind of refute or prove their efficacy. Um, so not to be outdone by Craig, uh, I decided that, you know, maybe doing some study on it and writing a paper for Eiders was a good idea. Okay. And, um, you know, the funny thing about being in the basement, playing on Facebook, being, uh, there's, there's no shortage of people on Facebook that have an opinion. Right. That's the beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, so you said, I want to try this. There's no empirical evidence. Um, you know, as someone who's done, you know, I think like a lot of us that nerd out on this stuff, we've done some testing in some fashion. Everybody's done some testing to some extent, whether it's a small little thing or extensive testing stuff that other folks do scientifically. I guess the first question is when you start to get the idea about doing this, how did you put together the plan on how exactly to test this? Obviously do it safety because there's probably an infinity number of ways to test it, right? Yeah. Um, when we first started thinking about it, you know, I, I think like most good ideas, um, we're like, oh, great, you know, we'll just, we'll just go build the high line and start dropping stuff. And as soon as you kind of think about all the variables that come into play uh, with high line operation, uh, it really turned into Pandora's box with um, what to test, what the parameters would be, what the equipment would be. Um, you know, how we were going to do the testing. Um, we, we talked about, you know, setting up over a river we have in town. Um, and, and quickly that got dismissed because um, we were, you know, hoisting up like 250 kilograms of, of concrete. Um, and we were pretty confident that like nothing would catastrophically fail. But if it did, uh, I didn't want uh, the fish cops uh, giving us a call. And we also didn't know how we were going to get the load, you know, back up 20 times to drop. Um, so we, we kind of brainstormed for a month or two about, um, designing the methodology first before we started asking for help uh, from manufacturers. Um, and we settled on two variables. We basically wanted to look at um, a, a mid-span carriage uh, that was kind of locked off, whether about to reeve or during reeve, um, and then simulated a moving carriage. Um, so we could, you know, pre-tension one side. And, you know, I, I'm sure, right, if you unpack it all and start doing the math, um, you know, every space along the track line, uh, the, the, the forces are going to be different. Um, so certainly this is, you know, one very, very small look at a very complicated puzzle, uh, but it definitely provided us some really interesting insight, um, and, and one, you know, uh, wants to do more testing. So, and let's, let's go back to the river portion. Um, you talked about, you know, doing this testing. I think one of the things that people don't understand when, it, when you have an idea to do a test, you have to come up with a way to test the test, right? Sure. And you can't just do one test. You have to do a, a number of them because you have to have a control. Right. And then you have to have variables and, and all sorts of stuff. But how wide was this river? Because I think one thing that people may not understand is forget the testing. Logistically, how do you pick up 600 pounds of concrete out of the water again? I'm sorry, water out of the water again and retest it a couple hundred feet across? Yeah, it's, it's a 250 foot span. Um, we, we've done training there before and, and shot highlines there. Um, but, you know, very quickly, like I said, we, we realized that we needed some substantial anchor kind of mid span, um, you know, to hoist this thing back up for, for 20 drops. Um, so we found an industrial site uh, that we thought was going to work. We spent a lot of prep time there um, cleaning it, painting. There was a, a perfect, you know, steel I beam mid span, um, painted one foot hash marks in black and white for high speed film. Um, and when we went to do our first test drop, we decked the load <laughs> on the ground. Uh, so we we talked with the property owner about cutting a hole in the wood floor because it was uh, kind of a demo site. Um, they said no. So then we started scrambling and uh, we, we found a, a theater at a local high school um, that was gracious enough to let us do the testing there. They had plenty of vertical space. Um, unfortunately, the span was only like 12 meters. So it was not nearly what we wanted, um, but it gave us a good starting point. 
and we have some leads for some bigger spans uh, to do more testing. Okay, good. I think that's important. I want to give a shout out real quick to Eiders. Um, this is something I'm an advocate of. I think obviously, Kevin, you are too. For those that don't know, Eiders is the International Tech Rescue Symposium. That's where you go to see what people like Kevin are doing and the tests that they, they do and what the research is. And he presented this program that we're going to talk about. So I guess to better understand the testing and the data, we must first understand what a high line is, what control lines are, and that sort of thing. So you kind of want to walk us through a little bit about your presentation, your testing, and how it yielded? Sure, yeah. Um, so that, that's what we're talking about. Um, there, there's 9 million ways that I've seen this rigged. Um, this is just one way, and we kind of put this together for uh, the Irish presentation. But, but that's what we're talking about, prusik bypass on the, the control lines that, that move the track line, uh, excuse me, move the carriage horizontally. Um, but before we started testing, we actually wanted to know who was still using it and kind of what their background was. So we sent out a survey on all the social media um, tech rescue pages. And I think we got like 225 respondents uh, overall, and it kind of trickled in over a couple months as we were um, starting to, to get the, the program together. And we asked um, if they use Prusik Bypass or not, um, what their primary rope background is, and we gave them choices of fire service, um, rope access, or um, backcountry slash search and rescue, and if they thought it was safe to use um, no Prusik Bypass. And then we gave the opportunity for some free form comments. Um, we, we got some, some hate mail, surprisingly, <laughs> uh, about how ridiculous it was that we were trying to reinvent the wheel. Um, we had some really great responses, um, but you know, when we quantified them, they, they kind of broke down um, into three kind of main categories. Um, surprisingly, like 60% of respondents said they still use Prusik Bypass on Highline control lines. And I think like 55% of the respondents had a fire service background, um, which wasn't a big shocker to me. Um, but the, the majority of the people still using are, are, are fire service based. Um, and, and the three kind of primary reasons for use um, were to maintain full strength of the, the control line. Um, with the bypass in place um, to be a visual indicator of overtension and then to protect the knot um, in, in case of a failure of the track line so it kind of acts as a shock absorber and it was you know there was a, a lot of different kind of paraphrasing on that but those were the, the three big ones that we we kind of saw in the respondents uh, answers and for the people who said you don't need them um, it was usually around um, the devices force limiting that there's no need um, and a couple other kind of generic responses um, so we kind of put it all together and reached out to, um, CMC and asked for rope, asked for help, um, from them, sent them our methodology. Um, when I sent it in, I, I didn't realize that, uh, Leroy Harbach, um, was going to be the point of contact for us. And his name's actually on, on the CMC, uh, rescue manual that we were kind of doing some testing to refute. Um, so if you've met Leroy, um, he really is a student of the craft and was really excited about the opportunity to look at this. Um, so I, I can't thank Leroy enough for kind of being willing to um, kind of look at something that, that goes against uh, a book that his name's on. Um, so Leroy, if you're listening, thank you. Uh, we got some help from Sterling uh, with Crossix, and we kind of put together, uh, like I said, two variables that we wanted to look at, uh, mid-span carriage with the control lines locked off, um, and then a moving carriage with one side locked off. Um, so we pre-tensioned one side kind of to simulate hauling, and then we put about 45 centimeters of slack in the, the opposing side. Um, the goal was to do 20 drops, um, 10 for each variable, so we could um, kind of do a standard deviation and get a, a three sigma if we wanted to. Um, so we did five drops without Prusix and five drops with Prusix in place. Um, the rope we used was 716 CMC Static Pro. Um, and not okay. my, what's my that? Favorite. Go back to the beginning slide real quick. Um, yeah. Just want to say one thing for those that are watching that may not know enough about high lines or fully understand it. Um, yeah, there are an infinity amount of results that you could get depending upon the rope you're using, the prusiks you're using, the size prusik relative to the rope 11 versus millimeter versus 13 millimeter, 8 millimeter prusik, 9 millimeter prusik, high stretch, low stretch, uh, 48 carrier, 16 carrier. So just for the whole world out there, uh, it's important to know that the, the testing data yielded was what he used to test. And obviously this is not all inclusive, the results are, but I think what's gonna be fascinating for people is that um, no matter what you do, the results are essentially gonna be the same. That's suffice to say, Kevin? 
Yeah, and, and you you know bring up a really good point that we kind of um, you know went over at length um, when we picked you know a, an HTP rope. We we kind of figured that was a worst case scenario um, instead of using something with a little more stretch. So we kind of get that that you know that worst case number. Usually um, we would kind of favor more of a, a nylon, more more uh, stretchy rope for our control lines, um, and you know using an HTP uh, for our track lines. Okay. Um, this rope um, had a two percent elongation at six hundred pounds, so it's it's you know uh, down there on, on your options, um, and they report a thirty five kilonewton minimum brake strength. Um, we use new Sterling eight millimeter bound loop pressics uh, with an end to end rating of twenty. Put rack exotica load cells on each side of the carriage. Um, like I said, we used two hundred fifty kilogram test mass. Um, it was a twelve meter span, and we used a three grain quick release. Uh, it's a parachute release, basically for activation. Um, and we terminated the control lines into uh, a rescue eight on one end and a brake bar rack on the other. Um, we, we wanted to dead end them and have no force limiting from the anchors so we could get kind of true worst case numbers at the carriage. Um, and we weren't sure which would hold up better. Um, so we got some, some ideas for future testing based on that. Um, before we dropped um, and, you know, you kind of opened the door for it, we did a lot of research into previous Prusik studies because there's hundreds. Uh, we looked at a lot of Eider's papers. We looked back from, you know, 2000 on and found nothing that really simulated what we wanted to look at. We found a lot of slow pull, a lot of dynamic drops, but they were kind of um, belay competency drop test um, type drops on tandem prussics. And the conclusion with all the prussic drops that, you know, we, we've all looked at is it's super inconclusive. The <laughs> condition, right? The, well, it is. The, like you said, the condition, the size of the host rope, the condition, the size of the prussics, um, there's way too many variables to, to really predict consistent prussic performance, um, at least for the sake of, you know, putting a safety factor on it. Right. Um, ballparking it for, you know, yourself is, is fine, you know, throwing a number on it. But if you're actually going to use that um, and expect consistent performance, we, we kind of concluded that that was not reasonable before we even started the testing. Okay. Um, so for those of you who don't know, that's what the, the three ring release looks like. Um, we had to modify it a little bit because it's actually built for deploying parachutes. Um, and we weren't sure if it would hold uh, 250 kilograms. Uh, it did quite nicely and activated perfectly every time. Uh, basically, the rings stack up on top of each other. And the only thing that holds it is a little bungee cord. Um, and we use Weed Whacker uh, line to actually activate it. Um, so that was each end. Uh, brake bar rack on one side and a rescue aid on the other terminated to chain uh, around some steel I-beams. And um, that's kind of what the, the testing setup looked like. Um, it's not obviously to scale. <laughs> and the height from the, the simulated track line was, was not quite that dramatic. Uh, but we wanted it to be as close to realistic as we could given the span. Now, why, if you Ooh. go back one slide, why did you yeah. decide to use an eight on one and a brake rack on the other? Did that skew the results as opposed to having two of the same devices? You know, so when we looked at the numbers after the fact, no. Um, for the the drops with no prussics, they were almost identical mid-span. Okay. You know, I'll bring those up in a second. We weren't sure which was going to hold better. Um, and in one of our test drops um, later, we kind of had a, a snafu that we hadn't expected. Um, so moving forward, we'll probably use uh, rescue eights on both sides or, or something else to dead end them. Um, we couldn't, unfortunately, do, you know, a, a tensionless hitch or anything around the IB, and we were worried it would not hold up well. Okay. Fair enough. But again, it's, you know, the first time we've done it, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see if this works. So this is drop one, and that's 600 drop pounds of concrete. Just about. Uh, super anticlimactic. We were kind of disappointed that nothing broke. Um, not that I wanted it to, but uh, that's, that was kind of all that happened. Um, so the peak force on the left was 6.66, and the peak force on the right was 6.64. Um, and the remaining drops um, were pretty much identical left to right, which you would expect, because um, we, were, we were pretty much mid-span. Um, very great standard deviation. Um, all five drops were successfully arrested, and they were within a tenth of a kilonewton of each other. Um, again, which you would kind of expect for, for a mid-span. So nothing dramatic. Um, so we added Prusix. Um, we added 
we had the same person kind of dress and set them, um, add the same amount of slack on each side um, to get kind of as close to identical left to right as we could. Okay. So this is the first drop of Prusix, just from up top. You see the three rolling release work. Actually nails our GoPro. And I see you have it, the concrete wrapped using a, uh, a moving blanket or something, using a wrap one, wrap all type of system? Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> that, that was kind of one of the other like, hey, how do we keep this from, from nuking through the bag? And we ended up using one of the, um, the dumpster bags you can buy at Home Depot. Okay. You know, they put a pretty significant rating on it and uh, we used a lot of ratchet straps to keep the whole thing together and um, webbing for the attachment point. Nice. And it stayed together the entire test, so that was pretty exciting. Drop nine. Yeah. And I see obviously the lighting was poor on the banner because you can only yeah, make it out. Yeah, it was terrible. We ended up uh, moving to hanging off the catwalk right in front of it for the remainder of the tests. So a little bit of a difference left to right with Prusix, but again, nothing you know really significant. Uh, we did have a mulligan on drop seven. Um, somebody forgot to mark the host rope, um, so we had to do a, an extra drop. Um, but they, again, were, were very, very close. Um, there was a small mean peak force with Prusix of 0.35, um, but nothing kind of dramatic that you would expect with, with all the hype about being a shock absorber. Um, neg negligible at best. And but those numbers are, are pretty consistent, so it looks like you're getting some good data there. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, were, we were really happy with, with the numbers we were getting. Um, and I, I was surprised, actually, there was, you know, only a very small decrease in peak force when we added Prusix compared to without. So. And for those that are just joining in or um, have kind of lucked in, we're talking to Kevin Lunny from Vector Rescue about his Prusix bypass testing. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and chime in on the chat, and we'll get them answered. Don't be uh, don't be a stranger. All right, go ahead, Kevin. Back to you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so the average peak force with Prusix was six point seven eight, um, and when you put the Prusix on, uh, went down to six point four three. So it was a 0.35 decrease. Um, the average slip uh, was three point seven six on the left and seven point one six nine on the right. Um, so there was really no correlation that we could find between the amount of Prusix slip and any reduction in peak force at all. It was, it was all over the place. There was a couple of Prusix that were, you know, two or three centimeters. And there was a couple, I think, that were up in the 15s, 16.7, 16.9, um, as low as 2.7. Okay. So there was, there, was, there was no correlation at all between how much Prusix slip there was and uh, any decrease in peak force. Um, but for all 11 drops, um, they were successfully arrested without kind of any catastrophic things happening. So moving, um, we pre-tensioned the left side to, we were shooting for 0.5. Um, they all ended up like 0 0.42, 0 0.45 um, pretty consistently. So whatever, we had a, a whole bunch of people helping us. Um, they got really good at doing it and it was, it was pretty close to 0.45 every time. And then we added 45 centimeters of slack uh, for the far side, we'll call it. Um, the, the thought process was is um, that, you know, in, in that movement, whether it's a, a device or tandem triple wrap Prusix coming out of a pulley, that it's, it's going to be acting like a belay. So we, we kind of picked 45 centimeters because that seems to be the, the average uh, slack when you're using like tandem triple wrap Prusix belay. Okay. Uh, super arbitrary. There was, there was no kind of method to it other than trying to find some consistent amount of slack to simulate the, the carriage moving away from that side. Uh, so this is drop 14 um, with no Prusik in place, uh, pretension left side. And we're looking directly at it at height, right? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Yeah, there. we. Uh, I ended up for like six hours one day hanging uh, in a harness under a catwalk to get the video because the, the videos from the previous day were terrible. So left side, <coughs> excuse me. 7.52 on the pretension side. <coughs> and the right side was 6.38. Kind of our, our assumption, and, and I am not an engineer, was that because we had pretension that its ability to kind of shock absorb the rope itself 
um, was kind of taken away by pre-tensioning it. Again, but your numbers are staying consistent, so you're getting some good data. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, we just did that. <clears throat> so left side was all 7.5. We had drop 16 was up to 8, but within half a can. And max force on the right side was all pretty close. Um, mean on the left was 7.6. Mean on the right was 6.6. .6. And the conclusion we came to, like I said, was just that the, the more rope we had in service on the right side um, allowed it to kind of dissipate more energy than the pretension left side. Okay. So Prusix, we put Prusix on, um, did the same setup. So this is the first drop with Prusix on uh, in a moving high line. And there's a couple different views of this because it yielded some interesting numbers. I'll tell you what, man, that concrete does move violently for a quick second there. It looks like it's going to let go. It, it does. You know, we, we were starting to worry that we'd have to readjust. Um, and especially with it kind of starting a pendulum fall to the left, uh, we we kind of thought it might at some point. Uh, so this is dead on. And then we have it in slow-mo. That really gives you a good perspective as to how those loads move relative to what you think they're going to do. Yeah, and, and you know the all of this the the kind of high speed stuff we did shoot the Prusix kind of chopped down the line like that, grab, let go, grab, let go, um, with with varying degrees of slip. Nice. So this uh, right side was at 15.52. Um, and, and we all stopped when, when they read that out. Um, we're like, that can't be right. Somebody, you know, we had it hooked up to, um, you know, somebody's iPad and it showed up at 15.52 on the right side, um, which we thought was an error. Somebody went down and looked at the load cell. It had a peak force of 15.52. Of and uh, I'm not going to lie. That was kind of, uh, our, our little mic drop moment where we're like, Oh my God, we, we solved it. Like, it's bad. It's really, really bad. And now we can prove it. We did a little happy dance and we're like, all right, we just need four more. We need consistent data. And, and like, this is going to be awesome to bring divers. So this is drop 18. We reset, did it again. And we got 15.06. So uh, as you can imagine, we got very, very, very happy. Did I lose you, Chris? No, I'm here. I'm good. Oh, okay. You're good. I'm <laughs> you're just very watching small. the video. Yeah, you're very small to buy on my screen. I couldn't tell. It is mesmerizing. It is. Yeah, so we got, we got 15.06, and uh, we're like, that's it. Done. This is in the bag. Um, and then traps 19, 20, and 21, we were at 6.84, 6.8, and 6.68 for the next three drops. So <laughs> what, what are you able to chalk that up to? Have you figured that out? So my heart sank in my chest, um, and my business partner, James, was up top doing that side of the rigging, and he was heads up enough to actually mark the brake bar rack. Uh, with a Sharpie right where the rope entered it. And on the subsequent drops, 19, 20, 21, there was actually slip of the rope out of the brake bar rack at 6.6, 7.4, and 8 centimeters. Um, you know, we, we talked about it at length, and, and he rigged it the same way every time. And on those first two drops, there was no slip out of the brake bar rack. Um, so the, the only kind of conclusion we could come to was that the, the slip helped dissipate some of that force. Um, but, you know, the, the results then are, are kind of toast. Uh, right. But the, the first two numbers uh, were legit. Um, so we didn't have enough rope to do more testing that day. 
So this is going to be one of the ones we want to repeat and uh, get a, a better device um, and maybe try the Rescue 8 on that side or maybe get a different site where we do like a tensionless hitch that, that definitely won't slip because um, that really like just crushed me to, to have two 15s as soon as we put press X in place and then and then get six, six, six. Uh, and just kind of... <laughs> but um, super interesting either way to get the 15s um, and, and definitely thought-provoking and worth more studies for sure. I would say so. Um, so just for comparison, um, the average peak force without Prusix was 7.6 on the hauling side. And when we put Prusix in was 7.1. Uh, so there's a little bit of a decrease. Um, same with the, the first set of tests. There was no correlation at all between the amount of Prusix slip and any reduction in peak force. Um, and then we added Prusix on the right side. Um, we had a huge increase in peak force. Um, the first two drops and then slips in the next three. Um, either way, all, all 10 drops successfully were arrested um, without incident. Um, so after we kind of collected everything, we started seeing some pretty gnarly um, bends in, in the host rope where the press had caught. Um, this was one of the worst ones, like 90 degree, you know, bends in the, the host ropes and bulging, um, all the glazing and kind of heat damage you would expect. Um, but we were curious if, if that press had did kind of core damage that would... Um, <laughs> I just saw a question pop up that I'd, I'd love to answer. Uh, Tom, I saw your question about using a, an ID uh, on the end for future tests. Um, yes, um, and, and we're going to actually talk about kind of force limiting concepts in a second. Um, we did, though, want to have no slip at all to get some kind of real data on what was happening at the carriage. But, yeah, that definitely came up. Uh, so we, we sent 10 samples to uh, New England Ropes. Um, left them just the way they were right after the test. Um, so we did the right side uh, moving with slack and then the left side in the first batch uh, not moving with no slack. Um, they pulled all of them um, at the figure eight and uh, wrapped a cap stand at the other end and they all broke at like 37 to 40% of the listed minimum break strength. The average was 21. So they broke right at the bend in the figure eight where they kind of always do. Uh, okay. So whatever damage was done at the Prusik was not enough to be uh, more damaging than tying a knot in the rope. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, while we're, uh, before we move on, Sean has a comment. Yeah. Be curious to see the load in a Stokes and Bridle to see the shock effect on those parts, Grion and Jag, Bridle. Um, I guess before we go on, have you guys thought about elevating this test and you actually using a bonafide Stokes with a, a Bridle to see if that changes anything with the testing of the Prusix and or if it has any other effect on the basket? Yeah, definitely. You know, we, um, as, as, as most people who have done testing figure out, you know, it gets expensive quick unless you can get support from manufacturers. Um, you know, so all of the, you know, the rigging plate that we used, um, all of the devices, you know, got spray painted black and went in a, a bit of death um, for, you know, stuff like this in the future. So if, if I can ever get my hands on a Stokes, that somebody wants to donate to us, we'd love to put a Stokes in it. Um, certainly concrete's gonna kind of swing around more than a person will. Um, but that peak force uh, is, is this, you know, the, the, the peak force on either side of the, the carriage. Um, you know, how that transmits down to the patient is gonna be different because the, the physics of them dropping, I think is gonna be a, a different force on them. Um, right. And I'm not sure what the arresting force would be between the carriage and the bridle, um, but that would definitely be interesting to, to look at also. Okay. All right, so you did the testing, uh, force limiting devices. For those that don't know, uh, there's a number of books out there that use the terminology force limiting devices. I know, I think we, we use terminology like the clutch, the ASAP, or not the ASAP, the uh, the ID or the MPD or the D4, or D5. We use that terminology synonymous with a descent control device, but the uh, true definition of them is force limiting devices. So a little bit of education. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that um, that came up in a lot of the feedback we got was that you don't need to use Prusik Bypass because all the devices force limit. And what I have kind of heard thrown around anecdotally, and, and I don't know how what you've heard, but, you know, this, this six kilonewton number um, of expected performance kind of generally applied to all descent control devices. And, you know, we, we went and looked because the manufacturers are great about putting all of their test data um, up. And we looked at, um, we used 11 mil ropes, we looked at the 11 mil numbers, but 
we combined all the numbers from the maestro, the ID, and the clutch, um, and the mean slip force was 8.5 um, for dynamic drops, but the range was 5.9 to 11.2. So that's, that's a huge range of expectation of performance based on all the things we talked about. Rope size, condition, um, the slow pull, mean peak force was 8.26. Um, the range increased even more from 2.6 to 11.56. Um, so if, if teams are going to expect, you know, their device to force limit, they really do need to kind of deep dive into the manufacturer provided data, um, on, on the rope in service and the device to kind of get a, a number if they want to have, you know, that, that six or eight or, or whatever they're expecting, uh, slip at, um, and, and not just expect it's going to work. Right. So again, are, are, are you, are you suggesting out there that, uh, people should be reading the manufacturer instructions and the data that comes with the stuff that they're spending a lot of money on or just take it out of the box and use it and never read about it. Uh, I, I love your, your, your sarcasm. Um, you know, one of the first lines in, I think everything we ever buy is, uh, you know, seek expert consultation or, or read this manual in entirety. And they've got the, the skull and crossbones on everything. Um, there's a lot of really good information in there. And if you go on the website, uh, most manufacturers have a, a lot of really good data on how they tested it and approved uses and um, making educated decisions on you know risk assessment. Based on that data, it's a lot easier if you have that those, those numbers. Absolutely before. right. Okay. So, um, you know, we, we kind of looked at all of it. And while we did notice a, a slight reduction in peak force um, with pressing bypass in certain conditions, there was this huge peak force uh, noted in, in those first two drops. And ultimately, um, 21 drops, uh, 250 kilograms was successfully arrested, and the mean peak force from all of the drops was 6.59. Um, so, you know, doing some quick math, you know, if we tie a figure eight in those those host ropes, um, you know, if we use the, the Rich Delaney method of just 50% reduction, we're down to a 17.5 uh, minimum break strength at the knot. Um, and that's a 2.4 kilonewton load. So we still have a, a seven to one static safety factor um, on our backup lines. And then using that 6.59, uh, we're still at a two and a half to one dynamic. Um, so Wait, I, 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 what's 7. that? 7.1 safety factor? Yep. But you're only at half a 15 to one. Right. I know. It's terrible. Okay. <laughs> we're all going to die. <laughs> so everyone's going to die. Continue. One of our followers, uh, you know, I thought you, were check, I thought you were checking my math. I was like, oh, God, did I? <laughs> no, you don't want me checking your math. I need a calculator and I take my shoes and socks off. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of concluded that, you know, if you're using a lower modulus rope, something that's a little more stretchy um, and, you know, applying appropriate force limiting techniques, um, I, I think it's safe uh, to, to not use prussic bypass. Um, and, you know, based on those first two numbers we had, um, I think there, there could be some unintended, really high peak forces uh, that we didn't expect. Um, so uh, I did thank Leroy, uh, Matt Hunt from Sterling helped us out, and, and Rob Manson from Teuchelberger um, helped us out with, with gear for the testing and, and doing some of the pull testing ropes for us. Um, and and I'll, I'll tell anyone who's interested in, in doing um, drop testing of any kind, um, you know, if you, if you really put together a, a good um, kind of plan, um, and, and send it out. Most of the manufacturers are, are, are budgeting money to, to help with this stuff because it's important to, to keep the industry moving forward. You bring up a good point. Well, I'll get to that in a second, but um, Tom has a, a question for you. For the drop. Hey, Tom, for you. For the, uh, yeah, hey, Tom, how you doing? <laughs> the drops with direct tie-in. For the tops with the direct tie-in, did you tie new knots every drop? Wondering yes. how much force is absorbed by the knot tightening yes we did tom so um we got a giant spool of rope um and every single drop had new host rope and new pressings and that's a great question um again going back to testing you know i think one of the people that may not realize that are new to the industry or you know really want to do some gnarly stuff or really geek out revenge of the nerd style uh yeah the stuff is expensive and you know the manufacturers will support you but it really is not as easy as just getting a bunch of rope and trying a test because uh, you guys had to put together the test. You had a sure. uh, you had a theory, and you had to put together how you were going to test it. Go out to the manufacturer. So from that first Facebook message you sent out, where you and Craig started talking, 
until you were ready to, to, to do the first drop? How much timeline went through that? And what kind of planning went into it? Uh, probably six months. Um, you know, to your point, um, while all the manufacturers are definitely willing to help and have a budget for it, um, if you just call and ask for free stuff, um, I'm sure they're not going to send it to you. You know, we had to send our entire plan, like you said, with, with our theory. These are all the testing parameters. These are the variables that we're trying to look at. Here's how we're going to control the experiment. Um, so we sent them probably a four or five page write up. Um, and then there was probably two or three subsequent uh, phone calls, emails back and forth, um, you know, submitting to iters to get the presentation approved. So before any of that stuff, uh, even like before the rope even showed up, um, there was probably four months of, of late work doing the prep and, and getting help, um, getting support from the manufacturers, uh, finding the test site, like I said, was very hard uh, because of what we were trying to do. It wasn't just a, kind of a traditional vertical drop uh, like a lot of tests are. Um, it was it was a tremendous commitment um, from a, a lot of different people that, that kind of helped make it happen. And I think some people think that they could just call up a manufacturer like CMC and say, hey, can you send me 2,000 feet of rope, two clutches, <laughs> you know, a bunch of prussics, a couple anchor straps and they'll, and they'll say, sure, we'll send it to you next week. Uh, doesn't happen that way. But in, in your case, you know, I think one of the things that's, um, is, uh, is, um, is evident here is that, you know, you're, you're doing a test for the greater good of the community and the rescue committee. You're not just, you know, getting stuff to do gnarly stuff on rope. Sure. You're, you're actually doing testing and that's, that's what's really important. And going back to your program, the conclusion, do you need Prusix, a bypass on a control line? And if you do, does it do anything for you? So what, what I would say is that, you know, uh, we don't use them uh, anymore as a business. Um, I think that each team should kind of look at what's an acceptable safety factor for their team, um, kind of run the numbers based on the ropes they have, the, the, the force limiting uh, techniques they have in place. Um, and if you really take care, you know, building high lines, right, by the time you get to a control line uh, belaying um, the system, if, if you've, you know, run double track lines that are that are redundant and truly, you know, independently anchored, um, you have to have two track lines fail before you, you get to your control lines catching. Um, and if you get to that point, you're having a really bad day. Um, I, I don't, you know, think it's it's uh, critical to use Prusix uh, at this point in, in Tech Rescue. Um, certainly, if you choose to use them, it's not, you know, necessarily harming anything, though, two of those drops we, we had 15s at. So at, at the very least, I think I would urge caution. Um, and, you know, this is not conclusive by any means. Um, and, and there's a lot more variables need to be tested. Um, so I would, I would say do it at your own risk um, based on the information we provided. You know, if it helps you make a decision, that's awesome. Uh, but, I, but I wouldn't make a boilerplate statement that you, you don't need to use them anymore either. I think that would be uh, not scientific of me. Well, I like that answer. If you want to go back to the first picture real quick, um, I'll comment on that in a second, but, uh, what I like about that is, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter, you know, what your testing yielded or what my testing yielded agencies, organizations are need to make a determination based on the facts and evidence. And if we look at this picture right here, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. So in, in your opinion, do you need it? Do you not need it? That's not up for discussion. I think for the folks to take this information back to the department or maybe watch the video as an organization and then go out and do testing yourself. I think one of the things that uh, Louis says every year at Eiders is, you know, do try this at home. And that's, I think that's what really makes this uh, such a great industry is that you guys can reach out to the manufacturers, do this and come up with data. And you're not telling people what they can or can't do. You're just giving them the information. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I think, right, in, in the in the scientific community, um, you know, until the, the test is repeatable, uh, you know, I think several times under the same conditions, you know, somebody else can take our work and, and get the same results. Um, you know, that that's when you start getting more credibility, um, you know, in the results. Um, this is one very, very small, you know, subset of, of data. Uh, but hopefully it at least starts a conversation about it. Um, and gets people to you know not take everything at face value. You know, the, we we just do it that way because I think asking why is, is very very important um, and, and looking at the math. Now, I got another serious question. Did you put any safeties in those knots that you made? 
No, no safeties. There's <laughs> a topic of discussion the other day in a text group that I'm on, and um, it's one of those just simple but such a hot topic to talk about, um, which is funny. I digress, but no, I, I you know I, I think so much of this right when the ladies and gents that kind of first you know started coming up with these concepts over the past 40, 50 years. Um, you know, every, every single thing we do, I think, in, in tech rescue, right, was was borrowed from another industry um, where they borrowed things from us. And there's a lot of cross pollination of ideas um, and some stuff just, you know, it worked. They, they had a, a theory about it, didn't have um, the ability to, to test it, really, that we do now. And, you know, one of the expressions I love that I hear all the time, right, where's where's the pile of bodies? Um, so, you know, nobody died using Presix. Um I don't think, you know, people have died not using Prusix either, right? Um, so, you know, as technology improves, as our ability to do testing improves, I think that starting to challenge some of the um, maybe dogmatic things that we do in, in rope rescue is important. Yeah, I would agree with that. And to Chris Bentley's point, I mean, yeah, no safeties. Uh, <laughs> you know, for us at, at MedTex, you know, I think it, to some extent, there's a lot of stuff you can teach. You know, you can teach stuff, we can teach stuff. And then to, to the other extent, when you're teaching under the umbrella of a fire academy, you're kind of limited to what direction you can go in. And sure. to, to some extent, how far and what kind of latitude. And again, you know, I'm, I'm a very sarcastic person by nature. Um, but no safeties, plastic bypass, 11 millimeter versus half inch. At the end of the day, it's what you decide to do, not what Chris from Rescue U or Kevin from Vector says. Just take the information, the data, and make a sound decision so you don't do something stupid like wake up dead the next day. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, you're, you're, you're dangling the apple. So, you know, let's, let's talk about it, right? The Everyone like rags on the NFPA and how like restrictive it is. Um, but what I, what I have found is that, that most people who throw out like, well, the NFPA says haven't actually like read the standard at all. Um, and it was just passed along to them that you, NFPA says you can't do that. And if you actually go look, right, like using tier G rated stuff, it says right in there that we do not specify. It's up to the AHJ based on team experience, acceptable safety factor. And, you know, there's a couple other bullet points, um, they don't say, you know, two person loads got to be G rated. They don't say a one person loads T rated. Um, none of that stuff's in there. Um, there there's no prescriptive uh, language and NFPA standards about how we do rope rescue operations. Um, so I, I just, I, I think that for people who want to really take their game to the next level, um, taking some time to read those standards and understand where and how they apply um, helps you make kind of, you know, critical decision making uh, easier. Yes. I would agree. And I was actually looking down next to my uh, bookshelf. I usually have a copy of uh, 1006 or 1670. Um, you know, one of the things that's music to my ears when, when I'm teaching a class, when somebody says to me, NFPA says, and by the way, I am I am a fan of NFPA. I'm not bashing them. That's not the intent of this. But I always say to somebody like you do, well, show me where it says NFPA says you have to tie an eight in a bite where you have to tie a bowl in with the safety. And what I found, and I'm sure you've seen the same thing, is you know a lot of these folks, they're regurgitating what they have heard, and they've never gone out on their own to try and find that data or validate it or find fault in it. Yeah. And, you know, and essentially, it's up to us, uh, you know, the third parties or the uh, fire academy instructors who are the nerds to be able to say to them, no, the information that you have is wrong. Yeah. And here's what they're suggesting you do. How you do that is up to you. There's 10 ways to tie a knot in a carabiner. Right. And, uh, you know, when it comes to high lines, um, you know, there's a million ways to build a high line or horizontal line or sloping line, whatever you want to call it. Right. Where the line is elevated, however that looks. Let's call it an elevated line. Um, well, that's good data. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's not like you did five years of scientific NASA level testing. And the beautiful thing is you don't need to do that to get enough information to make a decision for your team and develop your policies and procedures. And you guys did a, uh, did a great job presenting this at ITERS. 
Um, and it certainly was good talking to you a little bit more behind the scenes about this. And I hope the folks that are watching today, again, if you have any questions, go ahead and chime in. But I hope people are getting something out of it if they're watching this live or if they're going to be watching this pre-recorded or recorded at a later date. Um, so what's next for Vector? What are we going to see at the next item? Uh, you know, it's funny. We um, we had a side conversation with uh, Leroy after our presentation, and we, we want to kind of expand this out, get a bigger span, start putting in force limiting devices. Um, but again, right, like I can't buy and, and nuke clutches and maestros and IDs and, and all that stuff. Um, so it, it requires support and, and more testing. Um, that's, that's kind of our hope is to get the span bigger, um, kind of get, you know, that, that same load, start putting in force limiting devices. But I, I do really want to recreate that set of drops um, and, and see if we can recreate those those 15 numbers with Prusix in place, just to kind of sure. validate the data. Nice. Well, hopefully you'll be able to make it happen by Eiders next year, or I'm sorry, this year. Uh, if not, we'll look for it in the future. But um, so I've just started to wrap up. Um, what do you guys have online for the spring and summer? Um, we're jamming right now, actually. Um, we, we don't do a lot in the winter. We just started a 24 day contract uh, with two local fire departments doing uh, rope tech and confined space tech refresher um, for, I think, 50 firefighters. So it's three iterations, you know, over the next six weeks. Um, and then we start doing our open enrollment stuff. Uh, we kind of have our, our bread and butter, our vortex classes, both kind of a, a two day and a four day, um, our arborist rescue class, and then a whole bunch of contract classes in between. So we're, we're pretty much packed full through, you know, beginning of July. And you know, we usually take July, August off for family vacations and stuff, and then pick back up again in September. Okay. And not to dive into this, just a little, uh, you are involved in ITRA as well? Uh, I am, yeah. Um, I got on board uh, as a founding member uh, in 2018, uh, 2019, um, and was voted on to the board of directors this past summer. Um, so there's been a, a lot of really positive uh, things going on with ITRA. Um, bringing new members on board, um, streamlining curriculum, making assessments more easily available. COVID, you know, was was a huge hit to everybody, which kind of put the brakes on everything. Um, but I'm I'm very excited to be a part of it. I think it's a, a great thing for the the rescue world. Well, I'll just put a teaser out there. We will be talking about this in the future of the rescue land. Um, I will say that I am. How should I say this? I'm drinking a little bit more of the punch now. Oh, green screen. <laughs> I'm drinking a little bit more of the punch with ITRA now that I have been successful in the testing and, and know more about it. I still yeah. look Pratt, but we're going to be talking in the future wearing the Vector or you'll be wearing the ITRA shirt um, because I think there are good things to come and, you know, it's going to involve you guys and us. We can talk about that another time though. Um, yeah, no, definitely. I, I think um, I, I think it's it's a very good thing. I think the idea of, of third-party assessment uh, on your rescue skills that you have to re-verify every three years, um, I think is, is important. Gives validity to what you what you say you have. You know, you walk around and say I'm a technician in something. Um, that that should mean that you can on on the spot perform all the skills that, that are listed at that level. Absolutely. And um, well, we'll leave it at that. Um, <laughs> so I guess the question is, how can people reach you? What are? Uh, oh, hold on, let's uh, do this. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me, lots of ways. Um, you can go right on our website, vector-rescue.com. Um, there's a contact us page. Um, you can email me directly, kevin at vector-rescue.com. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. I think we're on LinkedIn. So I'd, I'd love to hear from anybody who wants to chat, uh, just nerd out about stuff. I'm happy to send the data if you want to take a look at it. Oop, there we go. All right. Yes, that's... Um... That is awesome. There we go. Working the graphics out. Um, again, Kevin, I can't thank you enough for coming on. Um, you know, we talked about this not long after. I actually, I asked you, I think, at Eiders. We yeah. talked about in November. So, breakfast um, the next day. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, for those that uh, uh, have any other ideas, suggestions, we're working on the um, second quarter of 2022. Uh, we're going to be doing, at some point, we're going to be doing a presentation, our presentation on Rescue Connection, on the presentation rescue you did at Eiders on the 600-foot tracking skate blocks in the cooling tower and the lessons learned from that. 
Uh, we have a couple other things in the work. We'll probably get that announced in the next week or two. Uh, we just want to get them finalized. But, um, you know, if you have any questions, suggestions, recommendations for us, please, by all means, send us an email, recommendations, uh, things you'd like to see. If you want to see more of him and less of me, shoot us an email. We're, we're happy to get bad email. We get we get fan mail. We get bad mail quite often. So don't be afraid to send us. And we'll have a huh? We'll have a hostile takeover. Yes. <laughs> Um, oh, and lastly, Chris, if I can cut you off, um, sure. we uh, just put on our social media recently, but uh, we just got accepted as a Petzl technical partner, oh, for yes. which we kind of so, talked about beforehand, but we glazed over. It's fancy. Hold on a second. Wait, let's look this way. You're, you're good. Hey, you go. Welcome to the Petzl technical family. Um, yeah, we're very excited. It, uh, it was probably 18 months of work. Um, and kind of vetting through Petzl, uh, but we're, we're really excited to be on board. And uh, I think it's going to help kind of uh, up our game um, for clients. So, Absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain we can both say that folks are going to see, uh, you know, a couple PTPs Northeast, mainly probably you and I uh, out there in social media land doing stuff in the future. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, everybody follow us. Um, but the feedback, the feedback is great. And that's the only way we can keep this going because, you know, it's a nickel and dime budget. Uh, but the intent is to really get the information out to everybody. So, again, Kevin, I can't thank you enough for uh, chiming in tonight and taking time away from your family. Oh, thanks and, so much. Uh, everybody else, um, thanks again. And follow us on Facebook. Follow him on Facebook. Follow us on social media. And we will see you next time on Rescue Connection.